Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this hot night. And I want to thank the Vineyard Trust for providing us with this lovely space and for allowing us to space you out a little bit more under these conditions. And thanks, everyone, for masking and for, for taking care of one another's health. Uh, my name is Mark Favreau. I'm from the New Press. We're a not-for-profit book publisher in New York City. Um, we're delighted to be co-hosting this event. Um, like you, we've been hearing a lot of misinformation about critical race theory, and we'll be hearing a lot more. And we thought the time was just perfectly ripe for more of a reality-based conversation around this really, really important body of work. So we couldn't have a better group of people, a better panel, to be talking about this with you tonight. And I'm going to kick it off by introducing our host, Laura Flanders. Uh, Laura is an award-winning uh, producer and journalist. She's the host and creator of The Laura Flanders Show, which is uh, syndicated on over 300 PBS stations and radio stations nationwide. She's a New York Times bestselling author. She has many, many accolades to her credit. And also, most importantly for our purposes tonight, she's really the perfect interlocutor for this subject. So thank you so much, Laura. Thank you to everyone for coming and enjoy the evening. All right, thank you, Mark. I'm gonna get up, if I may. It's a beautiful day out there, No one can hear me. I find that hard to believe, but I'll try it again. I guess my point in asking you whether you have spent the day vigorously tabling for truth or berating your local school board officials is to point out that had you been, had we been in Texas just one month ago, and had we perhaps been of a slightly different political persuasion, that's in all likelihood exactly how we would have been spending our day. July in Texas and Fort Worth saw the school board besieged by people complaining about something called critical race theory, which they don't happen to teach anywhere near Fort Worth, Texas. The names of the people that spoke in the school board should have been familiar to at least those who were paying attention because they're the same names showing up in petitions all across the state complaining about critical race theory being taught in Fort Worth schools. The names could have been familiar, so could have been the talking points that were raised in those complaints, because they were the very talking points that right-wing groups from the Heritage Foundation to ALEC to groups like Moms for the Republic have been teaching since last winter's vacation. While they've been doing that, you have a whole lot of very happy Republicans sitting back and saying, as Steve Bannon did recently, Critical race theory is the tea party to the 10th degree. You have a whole lot of people saying, we don't have Obama to beat up anymore, but now we have critical race theory. People may have kind of got calm about the COVID virus, but we can get them very excited about the virus of teaching about this nation's history. So tonight, we're gonna maybe fill in a little gap. If we perhaps haven't been as busy training one another in how to defend truth and teaching and diversity and the shreds of progress that we've been making as a country, well, then we're going to try to put that right tonight with our very own Prager U um, <laughs> in the form of Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. Devin Carbado, and we have our own videos to watch, we have our own talking points to train you in, but most importantly, we are sounding an alarm. We're sounding an alarm about something that isn't just rhetorical, isn't just entertainment, isn't just something that's keeping, you know, cable TV ratings high, or keeping people engaged in elections, or even just something that is fueling excitement about school board elections, which let's face it, we used to get more excited about on the left side of the spectrum than we do today. But conservatives going back, well, I first heard it from Ralph Reed of the Christian Coalition, where he said he would rather have a thousand school boards than one president and no school boards. 
And Donald Trump's advisor, Steve Bannon, said just the other day, the road back to taking the White House runs through the school boards of this country. But it's not just about what's happening in K through 12, as, you're here, as you'll hear. It's not just about what's happening to teachers. It's what your kids may or may not be taught. It's what your friends who are teachers or yourselves who work in education may or, not be, may or may not be able to teach. It's what may or may not be allowed in your corporations, in your businesses, when it comes to diversity and inclusion trainings. It's even about what you may or may not be allowed to screen on television or hear on radio or what grants you may be able to get from a local nonprofit. The cost that's being paid for this attack on critical race theory is already very high. We have about 11 states that have already passed legislation and about 16 that are beginning to consider it in this legislative year. We have way more than that that have considered le legislation and if we know something about, about the right, they don't give up. And those trainings from the Heritage Foundation, from ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, producing legislation that's being mimicked all across the country are continuing. So we better get started with ours. I'm going to introduce our guests right after we look at the video that the African American Policy Forum has prepared for educating people, waking people up to what's going on. Let's play it. Now it can be told. Last summer, the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery catalyzed an unprecedented worldwide mobilization, activating tens of millions of Americans of all races to demand institutional accountability and reform. As these images spread across the world, the right scrambled for a way to snuff out this transformative energy. And they think they found it by orchestrating a repressive censorship campaign. In Arizona, Idaho, Texas, Georgia, we are seeing school boards attempting to rewrite curriculums, teachers getting fired for educating their students about racial disparities, and potentially an entire generation being fed lies about American history. Make no mistake, what we are seeing now is a calculated backlash to last year's summer of racial reckoning. The right is gonna to try to convince you that we need to ban critical race theory, intersectionality, structural racism, implicit bias, diversity training, and the 1619 Project. But understand that this organized, well-funded, and coordinated campaign isn't an honest debate about these ideas. Most couldn't even define what these ideas are. And that's the point. They wanna scare and silence our society back to colorblind submission where George Floyd and Black people's killability is just a natural, everyday feature of American life, unproblematic, unchangeable, and disconnected from the history of anti-Black racism. From the criminalization of abolitionist literature to the McCarthy-era witch hunts, we've seen the government respond to liberatory movements through the repression of anti-racist ideas time and time again. If you are concerned about these efforts to censor history, to muzzle anti-racist speech, to expand voter suppression and to criminalize protest, we urge you to join us in standing up for racial justice. We need to fight back like our lives depend on it because they do. Kimberly Crenshaw is the co-founder and executive director of the African American Policy Forum. She's also the faculty director for the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies at Columbia. She's the co-editor of Critical Race Theory, Key Documents That Shaped the Movement. We have two copies at a desk right over here if you wanna get your hands on a newly reissued, right Mark, newly reissued uh, copy of this book, you can by signing the sign-up sheet. She's also the awardee, she was awarded recently the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Lifetime Achievement Award by the Women's Section of the Association of American Law Schools. Devin Carbado is the Honorable Harry Pragerson Professor of Law at UCLA Law School and the former Associate Vice Chancellor of Bruin X for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. He teaches constitutional criminal procedure, constitutional law, critical race theory, and criminal adjudication. He's the author of Acting White, Rethinking Race in Post-Racial America. So let me start with you, Kim, by taking us back 
to your first engagement, really, with critical race theory, taking us back to a time not entirely unlike this one, mm. in the 1980s. Some progress had been made, some mm. backlash was brewing. Mm -hmm. um, what was going on? <laughs> So thank you, Laura, and, and thank you, Mark, uh, New Press, for co-sponsoring this with us. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, and a relief, actually, to have some people that we can talk to about this madness who hopefully can understand um, where this madness is going unless we figure out a way to interrupt it. Um, so when uh, my first encounter with critical race theory was its absence, and by that I mean I was one of the post-civil rights generation. You would call us the kids who watched the civil rights movement on television, really wanted to be part of it, grew up with people like Thurgood Marshall being heroes in the household. So I uh, was raised by race men and women uh, of the 20th century with uh, a, a sort of sense that um, there would come a time where we would be handed the baton and our task was figuring out how to pass it on to the next generation. And my commitment was to do so as a lawyer. I wanted to learn how to do the special abracadabra to open up American society to continue the progress that had been made by that generation just before. Um, went to Cornell, studied in Africana Studies and Government, went to Harvard to study with Derrick Bell. Derrick Bell, as you know, was the Harvard Law professor, author of Race, Racism, and American Law. I fell in love with the book as an undergraduate. He had a lithograph in the front page of uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos in that black power salute in the, at the Olympics, which in my mind um, conveyed the idea that you can run the race, you can win the race, and you can also stand up for racial justice in doing so, that these two things are not mutually exclusive. I understood that to be the way in which he uh, addressed law. And this is what I and a whole cohort of students who went to Harvard Law School in 1980, I'm not gonna say the, the number, um, uh, went there uh, looking for Derrick Bell. Um, as they said about Elvis, he had left the building <laughs> when we got there, having been um, uh, frustrated about the slow progress of racial uh, integration on the faculty, having been frustrated with the notion that diversity seemed to apply to students, but not so much to what the curriculum offered and uh, what kind of scholarship was deemed to be legitimately included in an elite law school like Harvard. Um, our sensibility as students who, as I said before, watched the civil rights movement was that this was the new lunch counter for us. This is the new site of, of, of demand for services. This was the new space where the ever um, uh, evolving movement for racial justice was to take place. So we simply made what we thought was a quite reasonable uh, expectation uh, vocal, namely, uh, we want the courses that Derrick Bell taught to be taught. We are consumers here. We think that this should be part of what we have a right to have. And while you're at it, you need to do something to integrate this faculty because having one tenured uh, person of color out of a faculty of about 70 is just not what this new world is supposed to be looking like. So these were our expectations, our demands. The law school didn't see eye to eye. Uh, with us that very uh, year they hired 10 white male uh, junior uh, faculty members, uh, basically saying that there were no uh, qualified people of color that they could find to come to teach at Harvard Law School. That began uh, a multi-year struggle between students and the faculty um, to get them to walk the walk and talk the talk. It's okay to say that you're diverse, um, but it's not enough just to diversify the student body. And what was important to us and why it was a moment of awakening for us, Laura, was that the language of exclusion was now framed in terms of merit, in terms of colorblindness. We weren't talking about the Jim Crow of the South. We weren't talking about University of Texas, for example, that explicitly excluded uh, African Americans. We were talking about an elite institution that actually uh, admitted its first African American student in the 19th century. 
but didn't hire its first African-American faculty until the late 1960s. So the language was language that said, um, uh, we are not excluding people because of race, we're excluding them because the pool is shallow, without talking about how the pool is peopled in the first place, right? A pool that is based on the exclusions of the past is always going to be shallow unless you interrogate whether those exclusions were just and legitimate and whether we need to rethink how we go about determining who's qualified to teach at Harvard Law School. Remember, we had a civil rights revolution in the 50s and 60s that produced Brown versus Board of Education. Where did the intellectual capacity for that revolution come from? It wasn't from Harvard. It wasn't from Yale. Stanford, University of Chicago. It was from Howard. So one would think that to truly dismantle the exclusions of the past, they have to think about how those exclusions are actually being reproduced in so-called qualifications of the present. And that's effectively what we students were about. So the short of it is, um, we pulled together all of our resources. We created a lecture series, which we called our, our alternative course. We invited all of those unqualified people of color around the country to come to Harvard and teach a chapter out of Derrick Bell's book. Fast forward, all of those faculty members, those of us who were students, uh, came together about five years later um, under the rubric of what I then named critical race theory. Um, there was no critical race theory before. We just invited people to new developments in critical race theory. There was a critical mass of people who understood the limitations of conventional civil rights law, understood the limitations of diversity as applied to elite and uh, other professional institutions, read many of the same texts, talked about these limitations in terms of not being natural but artificial, and dedicated ourselves to rewriting how racial equity should be understood. And that became the, the focal point of critical race theory. So that's the beginning, Laura. So um, Devon, we in this country are very sort of, We tend to be, we in the US, um, we tend to be a little bit sort of skittish about that word theory. Sounds a little bit scary. Um, can you talk about how you came into this critical race theory discussion and what do we really actually mean? Sure, well first it's great uh, to have the opportunity to engage you all in this way, so, so thank you uh, very much for coming. I, I would say that my foray into critical race theory um, probably occurred in three chapters. Chapter one, I get admitted to law school. I'm traveling to visit the law school. I have a hoodie uh, with the words Harvard Law School on it. I'm walking through the terminal at the airport and um, uh, two people are walking by. One of them says to the other, loud enough for me to hear, Harvard must be lowering its standards. Mm. Moment one. I go to law school, moment two, um, and look at the configuration of the faculty, which is a clear indication that indeed Harvard must be low in its standard because there are very, very few people who look like me on that faculty. Moment three, I'm taking courses uh, in various dimensions of law, including a particular course that I would end up teaching called Constitutional Criminal Procedure, which is a course that explores the constitutional constraints placed on police investigatory practices, meaning what does the Constitution have to say about the terms on which police can engage us on the street. This course is happening against the backdrop of the Rodney King, um, brut brutalization of Rodney King, and yet the topic of race even in that moment is being suppressed, which is to say, trying to put race on the table against the backdrop of the uh, police violence that was captured on film was understood as a disruptive moment, as a moment in which the core issues of law were being subordinated to the raw dimensions of politics. Does that sound a little bit familiar with respect to what might be happening right now? Mm. 
Fast forward to my uh, uh, ending up at UCLA. And one of the reasons I chose to go to UCLA as a faculty member, quite frankly, was because um, Kim was on the faculty at that particular point. You can imagine, I'm going to join the faculty with Kim Crenshaw. That was a big deal. So I said yes. They had no idea that they had me at, here's an offer. I played a little bit hard to get. <laughs> so I'm teaching a course, the same course, Constitutional Criminal Procedure. And this goes to the point that Laura is raising about theory. So many of us have heard the term driving while black. To put that more precisely, many of us have experienced it. You know, I could ask you to show of hands, but you, know, you don't have to put your hands up if you don't want to. <laughs> but we understand what that means. A, you're driving a car. B, you're black. C, you're going to be stopped. That's a theory. The theory is there's something about my embodiment that tells me that when I get in a car, there is a likelihood that I'm going to be stopped. Doesn't mean that I necessarily will be, but the data suggests that likely I will. And the theory is about the degree to which criminality has been written into blackness. So there's a particular case, Wren versus United States. How many of you know this case? All right, one person knows this case. I will ask you your name afterwards, <laughs> not just yet. So here's the basic facts of this case, and here's why I think we should all know this case. So imagine I'm driving about the street right after this event. Imagine Laura is driving about the street right after the event. The police see both of us commit a traffic infraction. There's no dispute about that. Cop A says to cop B, well, both of them committed a traffic infraction. We can't stop both of them, so let's stop the black person. And for purposes of absolute clarity, let's stipulate that I'm the black person, not Laura. <laughs> so they stop me. I want to say that's unconstitutional. In other words, you see both of us committed a traffic, in traffic infraction, but you decide to stop me because I'm black. That's got to be unconstitutional. A unanimous Supreme Court says under, 40, under Fourth Amendment law, that is not unconstitutional. Now, you don't look shocked enough. Fourth Amendment protects us from unreasonable searches and seizures. So I want to say it's unreasonable for you to stop me on the basis of race. That's an unreasonable seizure. The court's response to that is, well, if the cop had probable cause to stop you, you committed a traffic infraction, Devon, so you cannot then say that the stop was unreasonable even though it was racially motivated. One more dimension of this court's ruling and then I will stop. The court also in this opinion says, let's say an officer wishes to, wishes to use the fact that you commit a traffic stop to investigate some other crime for which the officer has no reason to think you did anything wrong. So you stop in me, based on the traffic infraction to investigate whether I've done something else wrong. We would call this a pretextual stop. The traffic stop is a pretext to investigate some other crime. Is that constitutional? Yes. That's reasonable, right? Part of what I'm trying to suggest is having a conversation about race about that is not to take us off track. It is to reveal the ways in which race is embedded in legal doctrine. And indeed, if you don't foregone race in that way, you're not learning the law. So many of you don't know this case, but it's a case that is the legal backdrop for the driving while black phenomenon. We should all know this case. We should all know that racial profiling, at least by this particular metric, has been constitutionalized. This is what the against CRT move is trying to silence, and this is why we need to push back. So can you, would you, thank you, Devon. Um, let, let me ask you, Kim, to, to add to this, are there more ways that we need to understand this? And, and why, in your case, for example, was it law? that you wanted to go into? Absolutely. Why is law so important in this context? Yeah. Well, so there, the, the, there are two moves that we can see um, in, in Devin's explanation that I want people just to hold with them when you hear that 
critical race theory is being taught in the schools. Um, and, and, and it's this uh, nefarious um, uh, anti-American uh, insurgency that we have to stop if we want to save Western civilization. So the first thing is um, we do critical race theory every day. So every time as you heard Devin uh, speak, every time you know that you're entering a space in which your, your, your blackness may shape the interaction that you're likely to experience, you, you are practicing critical race theory. Uh, it, it is an understanding of how we navigate the world, what are some of the things that may happen, and how those things will be triggered by the encounter with our embodied beings. That, that's critical race theory. The second part of critical race theory is the part that few people know, and that is that much of what shapes our racial lives in this country is facilitated by law. So Devin gave you a great example of how driving while black is facilitated by law. This basic, basic observation is what is so controversial because there are those who want you to think that the terms of racial life in this country are basically determined by our agency, what we choose to do and what we choose not to do, by our culture by our individual orientation, not by what the law helps to facilitate. So if you, if you came in thinking that the law is like this neutral referee, it basically you know, does justice by deciding who's right, who's wrong, whose rights are, uh, are privileged, whose rights have been violated, I hope that that is an idea that you leave at the door. Because what we talk about and what we look at is how law is not necessarily the neutral referee. Law actually creates the game. It creates the, the, the equipment. It tells which side um, has scored and, and how in the next game they come back with even more power in the negotiation than they had at the beginning. This is not a conventional way in which we've been taught to think about civil rights law. We've been taught to think about civil rights law as this thing that does good. We haven't been th taught to think about laws actually having created what race is. We haven't thought about laws creating what kinds of accoutrements go along with being racialized as white as opposed to being racialized as not white. And we haven't thought about the rules that get put into play in deciding whether our claims of discrimination are gonna be affirmed or not. So here's another case you should know, Washington versus Davis. How many of you have heard of that case? So, so it, and before we go on, I just I wanna do something else. How many of you have heard of Roe versus Wade? Okay, I just want you to hold on to that for a moment, right? Because we all know about Roe versus Wade. We all know that that was a foundational case in deciding a woman's right to choose. Washington versus Davis was equally foundational, but in the opposite direction and with respect to race. The quick facts are these. Uh, Washington, D.C. Um, uh, used a civil service exam to determine who, which applicants to become police officers would be allowed to matriculate into officer training school. This civil service test did not test skills necessary to be a police officer anywhere much less in what they call an urban environment, basically much less what makes a good police officer among black folk. Nonetheless, the test was used, and the rate of failure for African Americans was four times the rate of failure for white folks, which basically meant it was extraordinarily hard for an African American to actually be um, uh, permitted to uh, enroll in, uh, the in the training program. Now, um, out, black officers sued. They said this was um, unconstitutional, it was discrimination, and it was not reasonable or rational. There was no reason to use this civil service exam, which basically was a vocabulary test, testing the vocabulary of a certain cohort of Americans and not the vocabulary of another cohort, particularly the vocabulary of the people that they were going to police. The Supreme Court ultimately decided that this was not discrimination. 
It's not discrimination because in the decision to use this civil service exam, there was no evidence that the decision makers were doing it because of animus against African Americans. No record to suggest that they did it simply because they hated black people. No evidence that they were biased intentionally against them. The only evidence was they chose to use the test, notwithstanding the fact that it wasn't correlated to being a good police officer, and it disproportionately excluded black people. Now, what did we get out of that moment? What we got out of that moment is an incredible narrowing of the field of discrimination. So all of the things that employers often did that had nothing to do with who is best for the job, it was just they were used to doing it, or sometimes they used these tests with the, the knowledge that it was going to disproportionately exclude African Americans. The Supreme Court ended up saying that discrimination is none of those things. The only thing discrimination is, is when you set upon a course of action with the express intent of harming people because of their skin color. Now, it's not as though that's, that's not a story about race discrimination, but it's a small story about race discrimination, and it's a small story about how you can be harmed by decisions that other people make that have nothing to do with your ability to do the job. So Washington versus Davis was decided in the mid-70s. It was, for all intents and purposes, a line that was being drawn in the sand. It was saying that all of these ways in which institutions structure opportunities in ways that disproportionately exclude us will not be subject to constitutional adjudication. That meant that the forward momentum of the civil rights movement ran up against a wall. And it ran up against the wall while we were in law school. So we saw the rationalizations happening. We saw the fact that the long-term consequences of this were basically met with a shrug uh, by many of our law professors. It was recognizing that the legal rules we're creating an end to the civil rights movement, not dying of natural success. It was not because we got to a point where everything was good. It got to a point where the law said, that's enough, we're not gonna go any further. And that became the moment where the backward cycle, in which we'll talk about in a minute, affirmative action uh, litigation um, started to come on board. So far so good. We are getting an idea of what critical race theory actually is. In a minute, we're gonna to move to all the things that it is not. Um, but before we do that, I just want to underscore and ask you, and maybe ask you, Devon, if what I'm hearing is right. You've talked about the shift from a structural perspective on racism to an individual one, the individual motivation of somebody. That sounds a lot like what we hear all the time when somebody says, oh, it's just a few bad apples. It's not a tainted tree. Um, and that's convenient for a whole lot of people who would prefer not to deal with the friggin' tree if we could just deal with the apples. Um, is that oversimplifying, Devon? And then we're gonna play a video to recap, to assess whether we've all really figured this out. And then we're gonna give you a chance to answer some questions about this part of the conversation. So if you have questions, you'll raise your hand and Mark will run around with a microphone, maybe this microphone. So prepare a question. But Devon, is that oversimplifying? Have we moved from sort of the tree to the apple? So I, I don't think that's oversimplifying. I, I just wanna underscore a point that Kim makes, because sometimes the argument is rehearsed that law lacks the capacity to deal with a range of social problems. And true, you cannot litigate your way out of racial inequality writ large. But, but think about Washington versus Davis for just one more minute. Because you could say that, what's the legal solution to that? The court is saying, look, um, intentional discrimination is the only doctrinal option here. You could say, no, it isn't. Another option is disparate impact. Right? That disparate impact is going to be the basis for understanding discrimination. But let's say that you don't like that option either. There's still another option. You could simply say, look, against the backdrop, we're talking about the 1970s. We are just up from Jim Crow in the 1970s. You could say, look, if you have a policy that causes a disparate impact, then justify it. Justify the policy. And if you can't justify the policy by telling us that this particular policy 
relates to some underlying interest, in this instance, being a police officer, then it's got to go. That's not a radical, unreasonable argument. That's a pretty modest argument to deal with the fact of underrepresentation against the backdrop of de jure racial discrimination. The court doesn't entertain any of that because it's in interested in putting in place a narrow understanding of discrimination that lines up with the bad apple frame. And we're familiar with the bad apple frame because it pervades discourses, for example, about police officers. I'm not interested in having a conversation about whether police officers are good or bad. That, to me, misses the point. The issue is, what are the sources of police power? And if I'm thinking about addressing the problem of police violence, I want to know, one, what are the social forces that put black people in contact with the police to begin with? So then I have to think about segregation. Mm -hmm. I have to think about mass criminalization, by which I mean the criminalization of really minor stuff. I have to think about poverty. I have to think about a bunch of stuff about why black people are having these contacts. That's one set of structures. Second, I have to think about police culture. I have to think about police unions. I have to think about police self-governance. None of these are about good or bad cops. Third, I have to think about, OK, so what happens when violence happens? How does the legal system process it? I have to think about police violence equals justifiable force. That happens way too much. That's not about good or bad cops. I have to think about qualified immunity, which remind me to come back to, but not just yet. I have to think about qualified immunity. I have to think about the extent to which you cannot sue police departments. These are not good and bad cop problems. They're broad structural ones that you miss if what you're doing is focusing on whether this individual cop engaged in an individual act of violence against an individual person and therefore is bad because it was intentional discrimination. Of course that happens, but it's under-inclusive of how racism operates. So you said social forces. What the right is saying right now is that critical race theory is just a product of nasty European Marxism. You say social forces, a whole lot of people say, well, there you have it. They're saying it's about social forces. Must be Marxist originated, is it? Well, um, one, one easy way to answer that question is to think about the extent to which uh, critical race theorists make deep and profound arguments about what the Constitution needs to deliver for everyone. So critical race theory is fundamentally about asking the United States to live up to justice, to live up to equality, to live up to liberty, to live up to its own aspirations. That's the fundamental project. You say equality under law is what people should experience. We say, let's realize it. You say justice is what everyone deserves. We say, then let's deliver it. You say liberty should be a core feature of American democracy. We say amen. So part of what critical race theory seeks to do is to ask the United States to live up to the very principles of democracy upon which it's founded. That's the core project. I don't see how one can conflate that project with Marxism. We are going to go back to qualified immunity now or later? Later. Later. All right. So let's look at a video, a little recap, and then if you have questions, pose them. If you Google critical race theory today, you're likely to encounter a slew of misinformation and fear mongering from the right. Critical race theory is a Marxist doctrine that rejects the vision of Martin Luther King Jr. Just because I do not want critical race theory taught to my children in school does not mean that I'm a racist. CRT looks beyond individual acts of racism and bigotry and instead grapples with the structures and histories that have embedded racism into law and more broadly into society. Developed by a diverse group of anti-racist legal scholars in the 70s and 80s, critical race theory is a practice, a way of seeing connections between America's racial history and present day inequality. We can't fight for racial justice if we can't see, speak, 
and learn about racial injustice. So anybody got questions? Anybody got questions so far? Right here. Thank you, sir. Anyone else so that Mark knows where to go next? Okay, then right behind in the white shirt and then right Hang over here to. in the other white shirt. Okay, go. Okay, all right. Uh, so good afternoon, Dr. Crenshaw and Dr. Carvalho. Thank you so much for coming today and, and speaking on this very important topic. So. You mentioned that uh, you know, with critical race theory, it's us asking the U.S. to take these um, concepts and to take these equities and make it, you know, um, apply across the board and make it fair. Um, for us who are lay people in this in this work and in this struggle, um, and also understanding that the Supreme Court's decision is the lay, is the law of the land and is is also one of the um, fuels that supports this inequity, what then do we do? Do we drum up cases that then goes before the Supreme Court to then dismount or unmount those racist precedences that are already there? Or is there something else that we need to be doing on the ground to expedite this call for US to be equitable across the board? All right, we'll take that question. And then Mark, if you can come to the woman here in the short sleeve white shirt. Right, that's you? Oh. Yep. And then you're coming here to the long sleeve way. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm involved with a national civics education organization. And the work of democracy education is intentionally being conflated with CRT and some of the bills that are being passed around the country are censoring and canceling civics education. I'm interested in whether or not you observe or, or believe that the avalanche of interest on the right around critical race theory is connected to the anti-democratic forces we've seen over the last several years around voter suppression leading up to January 6th and the fact that this, in fact, has now come to bring more media attention than the coup on this government. Great question. And the last one right here, Mark. And this gives our guests a chance to think. I, uh, Dr. Carvato, since before you touched on uh, policing, I wanted to get your thoughts um, on the policy in New York that was ruled unconstitutional, stop and frisk, and um, your thoughts on the incoming mayor wanting to bring that back. Okay, so we have a question on um, what do lay people do if the challenge is the court? Is the answer more court cases? If not, then what? Um, is there a link between vote suppression and the work against democracy that's happening, the anti-democracy backlash that we're seeing and these attacks on critical race theory? And then the last one, um, New York looks likely to elect Eric Adams, former police officer, as mayor. He has said he will revisit, stop and frisk, and in all likelihood um, reverse the, the suspension of that policy. Um, Devin, who wants, Devin, Kim, who wants to go first? Devin. I'll go with the stop and frisk question, um, in part because part of what's difficult about uh, that um, litigation and the way it emerged in the context of New York is a profound misunderstanding about um, how the case came down. So let's go back in time uh, to 1968. Just think about your favorite groove to get you there if you want. Uh, so in 1968, the Supreme Court is called upon to determine the constitutionality of stop and frisk. And what the court does in that moment is to say, look, police officers can stop you and frisk you. I'm simplifying things just a little bit. Um, without probable cause, if you have reasonable suspicion, so reasonable suspicion is an evidentiary standard that's higher than a hunch, but lower than probable cause. So it ain't a hunch, but it's not probable cause, okay? That's reasonable suspicion. And the court says, and who is speaking for the court? Justice Warren, you know? And I, the writer I, 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 The person who wrote Brown, I can digress and go into that hole, but then you'll say, come back, and I won't be able to come back, so I won't do that. Come back. I, I, I will simply say this. I'll simply say this. When the issue arises in New York and the uh, Judge Shinlin, who is the district court judge in that case, says New York police officers violated the Constitution, she did not declare stop and frisk unconstitutional. 
Stops and frisks have been constitutional. They are constitutional. The particular problem in New York was whether officers were even abiding by the reasonable suspicion standard. <laughs> so our point was that in New York, police officers were stopping and frisking people even without reasonable suspicion, which is just a little bit more than nothing. So that was one basis on which she said um, what they were doing was constitutional, not that stops and frisks were unconstitutional. The second thing I will say is that the Judge Sinden also said that the disparity and level of intentionality, racial intentionality in that case, suggested that New York police officers also violated the equal protection um, clause, that you're not treating people equally on the basis of race. But to be clear, stop and frisk has been a feature of policing for a long time. The New York litigation did not stop that. So when you know, a plausible income in mirror saying he's returning to something, I don't know what exactly that means. It's more political talk and probably a particular disposition with respect to policing than an actual shift in the legal terrain. Yeah. Kim, you want to pick up either of the other two yeah, questions? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with what do we do? And, and, and it, it somewhat goes to the question I asked earlier when I said, how many of us know um, Roe versus Wade versus how many of us know about Washington versus Davis? I could probably come up with five more cases that actually represents the unraveling of the forward movement of the civil rights movement. And, and we, don't, we don't know about it. Right. So one of the things that is most um, disconcerting about this moment is that we, even, we haven't even gotten to a point of recognition in our society that would justify any claim that critical race theory is everywhere. Because if it was everywhere, we would know these cases and we would know its impact you know, on our future. So just the very possibility that in different pockets uh, in American society, people are thinking more critically about the state of our lives is enough to make the other side decide that they have to wipe it out. We're barely on the table, right? So um, where does that leave? A couple things. Number one, um, literacy about the terms, the legal terms of our lives is absolutely essential if we believe that black lives matter, right? It's not just a chant. Right? If it matters, we have to understand the legal terms by which our lives have been made not to matter. And a lot of that is in the law. Um, the second thing then is that it also means that um, Supreme Court and just judicial appointments need to be seen as, as important as they are. Um, and yet with, with voters who tend to vote um, Democratic, um, court appointments, they're kind of low on the list. Not so on the other side of the aisle. Not so. So um, those who want to wipe out um, progress on racial justice understand that the courts are absolutely essential to their long-term agenda. In fact, the courts that we have now are the product of a 30, 40 year campaign to basically retake the courts while we have been focusing on other things. So the 2016 um, election, I think courts for, for, for Democratic voters were, were like fourth or fifth on the list. That, that's too far down, considering the fact that courts determine the rules of the road. They determine how you get from point A to B. They determine what happens along the way. So I would say, number one, much, much more demand on our part to understand the role of the law in this. Much more support for the kind of critical thinking that is necessary for it to be explained. And lastly, we need to really foreground judicial appointments in our vetting of our candidates. We can't have candidates anymore who wait a couple years before they decide to take on the courts. We, the reality is, at this point in time, Thurgood Marshall couldn't be nominated and affirmed. That, that's how far to the other side uh, things have gone. And when that's the situation, we cannot be surprised when we, when we lose uh, significant, significant cases. And on the last question, the next section is precisely that, how to connect the dots 
between repression of civil um, uh, voting, repression of protests, and repression of the very ideas, the very ability to speak anti-racism, they're all connected. Thank you. So we'll come back to more of those answers in a bit. But let's move to this question of what work the attacks are doing. And we're sort of torn up here between emphasizing how specific this situation is and remembering that it is not unprecedented. So with, you know, out wanting to shed any differences, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about threads that connect this work of, of myth-making and attack that we're seeing around critical race theory with others that we have seen in the um, at least vaguely memorable past. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> Unless you had a plan to go in the other direction in which you are completely entitled to do that. Um, you know, when it comes around, you gotta ride it because it might not come around again. Um, so, so much of, of, of what we're experiencing right now it is part of a cycle. Um, and if we look at our own history, we see that every effort that we have made to make um, good on the promise of equality has been met by backlash. It's been met by retrenchment. Um, we sometimes characterize that as two steps forward, one step back. That, that's part of how we understand um, our cycles. But I, I would propose that actually the situation might be more um, challenging than two steps forward, one step back. It may be one step forward, two steps back. Let's think about Reconstruction, right? After, after the end of slavery, our president at that point vetoed a civil rights bill that gave us equal rights to contracting, to own property, um, based on the argument that it was reverse discrimination against white people. We are just barely out of slavery, and doing anything for us is seen as taking something away from white people. 20 years after that, civil rights bills that give us free, uh, equal access to, to trains and ends, um, that is struck down as unconstitutional as giving us special privileges. At that same period of time, our right to vote is, is being denied by constitutional conventions across the South. That didn't last just for a season. That lasted a century. It wasn't just about one election. It was about seven decades. So what we know is that often even symbolic measures of advance create such a deep backlash that it takes us decades to dig, dig our ways out of it. So if we want to look at this moment uh, in this historical frame, we have to understand that part of what this is is a reaction to last summer's George Floyd activation. But we also have to realize that that George Floyd activation is still struggling to get legal reform based on that, whereas the backlash has swept through red states and is now knocking at the door in purple states. This is the prescription for the same kind of seven decade being pushed out of political power that we know that we came out of. So it is cyclical. It reproduces itself in ways that sometimes push us further back than where we started from. We've got to be able to recognize the patterns to interrupt them before the groove is so deep that it's difficult to, to stop it. This thing has been going on since September, since President Trump created an executive order to ban divisive concepts from diversity training in the government. Yes, President Biden rescinded it, and then it blew up all across the states. And we are still putting our boots on. You know there, that, that saying that a lie gets around the world three times before truth puts its boots on? We are still looking for our boots. And we cannot afford this if we are going to survive this moment. Citizens Renewing America, one of the nonprofits that's been training people and getting people to um, learn talking points to take into school boards and exposing, you know, showing people videos to learn what's so terrible about critical race theory was headed up by the guy who headed the Office of Management and Budget in the Trump administration. You know, these people don't just go away. 
they stay active and they want back into office, but we nonetheless are kind of pathology, pathologically attached to this idea of progress, um, Devon. Um, there are other myths that you wanted to draw to our attention, I think. Uh, in, in some ways, there, there are too many for us to meaningfully engage, but I think it's important that we put into sharp relief um, several of them. So one classic myth um, that's been rehearsed even before this particular moment is that a critical race theory believes that colorblindness is inherently, in every context, a problem. Now, if you find yourself arguing against that, not a pretty good place to be in. So I want to be clear about critical race theory's relationship to colorblindness, because this, we want to suggest, is really important. Critical race theory challenges the radicalization of colorblindness in the service of a number of different projects. So one, colorblindness gets radicalized to sort of turn a blind eye to problems of racial inequality. And this you see explicit in the law, but you see in political discourses as well. So what do I mean by that? So in the law, for example, you see explicitly articulated the idea that societal discrimination, that's too amorphous a thing for us to do something legally about. Societal discrimination, too amorphous. You heard Kim talk already about Washington versus Davis. Racial disparities, we can't do anything about that. Show me a bad apple person, then we can talk. If you can't show me that, then just go away. So one way in which colorblindness works is to just say, see no evil, you know evil, I don't want to see it. Mm -hmm. A more pernicious way in which it works is to say that efforts to address racial inequality, racial remediation efforts, are presumptively suspect. So the basic idea and sit up, because this should shock you, you weren't shocked enough before, is that the law treats efforts like trying to create majority minority voting districts. The law sort of thinks about those efforts or affirmative action. The law thinks about those efforts in the way that it thinks about Jim Crow. You're both using race. You're using race to think about majority minority districts, You're using race for Jim Crow, Therefore, we're going to apply the highest standard of scrutiny to figure this stuff out. Why? Because we can't figure out whether this is good or this is bad. We just can't figure it out. I, I'm not even exaggerating when I say that Supreme Court decision-making reflects the idea that judges lack the capacity to draw a distinction between invidious uses of race and benign uses of race. They just can't do it. They throw their hands up in the air. Therefore, all uses of race must be subject to strict scrutiny. The third thing I want to say about colorblindness, which is crucial, it seems to me, is to go back to Reconstruction. Let's think about the precise context out of which colorblindness emerged. So we'll see the quote in a minute in which Justice Harlan is dissenting in Plessy versus Ferguson. So you all know Plessy versus Ferguson. That's the case that says segregation is constitutional. All right? So Justice Harlan dissents. He says segregation is not constitutional. It's unconstitutional. And in that context, he articulates the idea that our constitution is colorblind. All right? And in the context of saying our constitution is colorblind, Justice Harlan also says the white race is the dominant race in this country. So I doubt it will continue to be if it holds true to its values, traditions, etc., There's the quote. That's the quote. Now, when you read that quote, you have to remind yourself that Justice Harlan is arguing against racial segregation. Do you like that quote? Do you like that quote? I, this is call and response. Do you like that quote? <laughs> you do not like that quote. Because it's a quote that presupposes that you can have a colorblind constitution on the one hand and white mm -hmm. dominance on the other. Why aren't we talking about this when colorblindness is being radicalized? So it's not that we're saying that colorblindness is per se bad in every context. It's that we're saying that colorblindness can coexist with forms of racial inequality. And the very context out of which colorblindness emerged 
teaches us that, Holland is both arguing against racial segregation on the one hand and suggesting that why are you worried white people about integration? We're going to remain the dominant people in this country, full stop. Mm. So we need to contextualize this particular point as a way of understanding that myth. All right, so I don't want to compare Judge Harlan to the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, um, but I want to ask you, Kim, to respond to what just happened there. On August 9th, the, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents felt called upon to comment on this critical race theory um, brouhaha and to state whether or not it teaches critical race theory in public school. And the statement that they released said the simple answer is no. We do not teach CRT. They're familiar with it enough to use the acronym, but yeah. Um, and they say that, you know, they don't teach it. What we do teach is the curriculum frameworks for history and social science. Since 1993, that curriculum has required various things. One of the things it requires is an effective history and social science curriculum that teaches the legacy of democratic government. Another thing it teaches, it requires, is an effective history and social science curriculum that incorporates diverse perspectives and acknowledges that perception of events are affected by race, ethnicity, culture, religion, education, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, and personal experience. I could go on, but I, I suspect you might have some thoughts on what the board <laughs> has done, is that enough, sufficient, game over? It, it, it gives me a, a flavor, thanks. Um, so it, it, I have to say this is what was tactically really uh, so effective about what the attack on something that nobody knows what it is does, right? Um, it, it's a little bit like, um, do you still beat your wife? There is no, there is no answer that doesn't indict you. So for them to say, we don't teach critical race theory, um, is basically to say that um, that thing um, that you guys have framed as being all these terrible things, we, we're not gonna, we don't have anything to do about that. It basically um, tries to deal with the attack on anti-racist education by saying we don't do that thing that you guys have packed everything having to do with anti-racism into. Um, now, I have to say initially, I, all, I also said, what, what's this all about? As far as I know, uh, critical race theory, the course, is not a topic in K through 12 education. But that's not what this attack is about. Right? Saying, no, I'm not doing that, doesn't work when the real attack is on any kind of racial justice-oriented education. So you can run from the name. That's not what they're after. They're after the substance of what it is that is being taught. So if we learn anything from other moments like this in which the right has come after something and we thought we could continue doing it by calling it something else, then that should be enough of a um, cautionary tale. So what else has happened like this? You guys remember ACORN? Okay, same thing. Bunch of lies got told about ACORN from the far right. Mainstream media didn't do anything about it until it became hugely controversial. Then when the mainstream media came in, they didn't come in to report the story as basically being um, a misinformation campaign against a social justice, racial justice organization. They reported it as a controversy. It's a controversy that most people didn't get involved in. Have you heard of anything about ACORN since? It destroyed ACORN. Affirmative action, same thing. Affirmative action is attacked as preferential treatment. Mainstream media comes in, they use the same terms of the attack. Rather than asking, well, what actually is affirmative action? What actually does it do? What are the contexts in which it's useful? So the same thing has happened in the past to important social justice concepts. The point being, we cannot simply run from the names of the ideas when what they are after is the work that the ideas actually do. If you actually look at the legislation, 
It's legislation. Most of it doesn't even name critical race theory, by the way. It basically says divisive concepts cannot be taught. It says um, concepts that make individuals feel a certain way, feel discomfort, right? feel shame, cannot be taught. It, it is a concept that suggests that the feelings of being presented with material from the past are more important than the realities that are created from racial injustice in the past. What is a better case of fragility than the idea that how you feel about something is gonna determine whether we learn about what it has actually done? That's the world we're living in right now. And one form that that's taking that you know, just to make it super concrete, in Tennessee, they have now banned distributing um, Ruby Bridges' biography to school students because they said it makes the white students so uncomfortable to see the pictures of the angry white people. Ta-Nehisi Coates, Brian Stevenson, these are all texts that are now being ejected out of libraries. Uh, I want to ask you, Kim, to play a video we're going to play a video that your organization produced, and afterwards we're going to talk about why we're playing this video, um, to address this question. I think we're coming back to this question of what could be the real consequences, what are the real consequences, and what the heck do we do? Okay, so um, the equal opportunity running track, racetrack video.
That video did some work. It also ruffled some feathers. It did. It did. So we, we created this uh, video in the middle of the affirmative action wars. Um, uh, many of you know that the attack on affirmative action moved from uh, the constitutional courts then to state uh, bans on affirmative action. And one of the constant challenges was the way affirmative action was framed. It was often framed as it's a battle over reverse discrimination or battle over preferential treatment. Even people who were supporting affirmative action fell into using that framing. And our goal was to help people understand that removing obstacles to fair and equitable access is not preferential treatment. It's preferential treatment when you allow them to stay there. It's preferential treatment for the people who don't have those obstacles on their pathways compared to those who do. So our goal was to try to just find a very simple, easy way um, of showing the intergenerational dimensions of, of exclusion, white supremacy, how wealth ac accumulates over generations, how obstacles make it that much harder to play, how catch up is not even possible without direct policies that take into account this histories uh, and these obstacles. So um, we created this video, it was useful. Um, millions of people watched it, it was used in training and equity and various other places. Well, one high school decided to use it when there had been a flare up uh, around racial tensions in the high school use of the N word over the, um, the public, uh, address system, um, and they decided to have a day in which students would talk about race and racism. So the faculty used this video uh, to begin the conversation. Um, one parent, uh, one grandparent decided that the video itself was racist um, and took it to Fox News. It then became a, a cause on Fox News. Um, a school board meeting was held in which the school board apologized for allowing this video to be shown. Now, this happened about 10 years ago. It was in, in Rico County. Some of you may know that it is the home of Richmond, which is the home of the Confederacy. The idea that showing a video about the historical dimensions of white supremacy would be framed as reverse racist and a guilt video was just outrageous. And we thought, all right, you just gotta chalk it up to that particular school board. Little did we know that that was the beginning of an idea that a direct confrontation with history and its contemporary consequences would be framed as a guilt video. That's what happened there. It also happened in Arizona with the Chicano Studies program in which students um, who went through that program did extraordinarily well, increasing in test scores and college matriculation. The state of Arizona uh, made it illegal and threatened to withdraw educational resources from schools that use the program. So this is not about educational e excellence. It's not about education at all. It's about whether a story can be tolerated that makes it clear that there are advantages and disadvantages from the past that continue to be built into our system. And so this is an attack on even being able to say that there is structural inequality, to say that the past still shapes um, this immediate future. That was the beginning. We should have anticipated that it would grow. It has, and now it's the juggernaut that we're facing right now. Anything you want to add to that, Devin? Um, one aspect of this moment that is different from when that was made is the power of right-wing echo chambers, the comparative lack of engagement of even the so-called liberal media or their familiarity with any of what we're talking about. Um, and also, you know, speaking as a white person, the, the flip side of what you talked about, the killability of African Americans is the perceived unkillability, an actual unkillability of white people as demonstrated on January 6th. So to me, this feels like a super dangerous moment, and yet one that many of us are nonetheless trapped in our silos, in our algorithmically designed bubbles, such that 
when you wrote to me about the first time the attack on critical race theory had been uttered by President Trump, I hadn't seen it. It hadn't come to my feed in a way that got my attention. And I host a television show I read and subscribe to a million things. So talk if you could, Devin, maybe kick off the conversation about the critical importance and, and fragility of this moment and whether you see examples of effective comeback. Uh, because as Kim said earlier, part of the attack, part of the problem with these kinds of attacks is the attack itself does the work. And by the time you respond, you're just adding fuel to the fire. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's, I think it's uh, particularly important to begin where Kim began, which is to say, for far too long, people on the left um, slash liberal side of the aisle, if you like, have um, misunderstood what the contestation uh, over affirmative action has been about. In other words, the fight about affirmative action was never just about affirmative action, though it was about that to be sure. Uh, the fight about affirmative action was about all forms of racial mediation, and it's relevant to the particular moment in the following sense. So the Supreme Court, what the Supreme Court did to affirmative action is what conservatives are now doing with CRT. Here's what I mean. So what the Supreme Court did with affirmative action is to tell a narrative about the degree to which this is damaging white people, is discriminating against white people, and is conferring a bunch of benefits um, to particularly black people. That idea didn't stay with affirmative action. That idea then carried over, metastasized, so that it would limit voting rights, and I can map the case, so that it would limit racial mediation in employment context, so that it would limit voluntary integration, so they have a fight over here, and then they export it over there. They're having a fight about CRT, but it's about diversity training, it's about civic education, it's about corporate diversity, it's about the very possibility of invoking an anti-racist sensibility. And we miss the terrain if we think that it is about quote unquote critical race theory per se in the same way that we missed the terrain when we understood it to just be about affirmative action. And I think if nothing else, uh, leave this moment understanding that there's a fight over the baseline. The dominant way for thinking about the way things are, black people experience slavery, black people experience uh, Jim Crow, black people are over-incarcerated. Your assumption should be that there's some relationship between the history of slavery, the history of Jim Crow, the underrepresentation of black people, the underemployment of black people, the over-incarceration of black people. If that's not your assumption, then you are saying there's something wrong with us, okay? And so you've got to think about how that narrative further constructs a story about black subalternity. That's what's particularly dangerous about this moment, it seems to me, is that there isn't enough of an interrogation of the way things are. The way things are are rooted in historical practices, historical laws, in ways that we insufficiently take account of. And, um, the absence of that historical understanding limits our possibility to move forward, particularly against the backdrop of the kind of broad structures that exist for dis dem disseminating um, these distortions. But our democracy story tends to be told over here when our affirmative action, critical race theory, racism story gets told over here. Is that shifting? Kim? Kim can speak to that more robustly <laughs> from I, but I, because, well, I, because, because of the, the, and you should tell the stories about trying to engage in disrupting that dichotomy, the kind of pushback that you get. Yeah, well, so, you know, I, I know, I know we, we, we come to a point in this conversation in which um, the, the, the question is what to do. Um, and some part of what we're queuing up here is a lot of the work is creating the connections between all the things that we're seeing. So earlier the question was, what's the relationship between the attack on voting, the attack on protest, and the attack on critical race theory? Turns out it's really um, the same people 
uh, doing the same thing. If you look at the states that are attacking voting, they um, overlap with the states that are attacking critical race theory, which overlaps with the states that are trying to criminalize protests. What is it they're trying to do? They're trying to eliminate our political power, our ability to choose. They're trying to eliminate our ability to complain about our <laughs> inability to choose. And they're trying to eliminate our ability to speak it and to speak it historically. This is what has happened before. The attack on learning has always been a response to black people mobiliza mobilization. The attack on our, even our ability to testify in court against white people. If you can't speak, of course you're, you're subject to be injured. That was once a part of law. We're moving in that direction with, the, with respect to not being able to speak historically about the situation we're in. So you might ask, where are the allies? Where, where, where does the rescue kind of come from, <laughs> right? Um, I want to tell you they're right over the hill. I, I want to be able to say that. In reality, I have to say, they're still trying to figure out whether this particular issue is important enough for them to get involved in. They're still trying to figure out. I mean, y'all know this. There should be no question that we need a, a Voting Rights Act right now. That should not even be contested. And yet, those who depend most on our votes are kind of sitting it out, taking a wait and see kind of approach. They're going to see pretty soon that we cannot out-organize an intention to repress us. And so they've got to stand up right now. The same instinct behind trying to push us out is the same instinct be trying, be, behind trying to, to silence us. So part of what we're trying to do is make sure that the, that, that the pro-democracy people understand there is no daylight between racial justice and a multiracial democracy. These are not separate issues. When those people showed up on January 6th with the Confederate flag, that wasn't an accident. When they say you're taking away our country, they mean that. They think that this is their country. So for them, it's not even really about fraud. It's about the fact that these hands chose the president. It's about the fact that this country isn't recognizable to them anymore. It's about the fact that they have been bred on an idea that this country belongs to people that look a certain way and not to all of us. So that's the challenge now, to bring, to bring pro-democracy into a conversation about racial justice, racial justice into a conversation about pro-democracy, both of those into a conversation about how our media are not serving us well. All of these things have to be at the top of our agenda if we're going to be able to pass that baton on to the next generation. I'm committed to doing that. I, I know our ancestors worked tirelessly to be able to pass this baton to us, and I am not going to allow this to preclude what we can pass on to the next generation. So we've got to get together to do the work necessary to fight back against this effort to repress our very ability to imagine what a multiracial democracy has to look like. So we have about 10 minutes for questions, more questions, more answers. Um, while you're thinking of some, I will just suggest that this is a great time to get your um, organizing shoes on. The school semester is beginning. If you happen to live in Tennessee, your public school system, and let's remember that public school budgets are also under attack here, um, is going to be penalized between one and five million dollars for every infraction of the ban on critical race theory. In Wisconsin, 10 percent of the public school budget will be cut for any district that receives over a certain number of parental complaints. And we know who's organizing those parental complaints. Um, and they are the same people with the same talking points that you'll see um, talking about fraud and the, and the big lies. So, we have an opportunity to engage where we are, be it a boardroom or a um, school board or just as a parent. I don't mean just as a parent. Don't forget, moms for the republic. Um, anybody got questions? Right here. 
And then right back there. So let's take those two first. Hi, my name is Mia Hall. I'm a podcast host and content creator of Parables from the Projects podcast. Um, I wanted to ask, like, as a creator, um, how can we not, or, or I don't know if it's embody, you know, critical race. I mean, like, of course, we do it every day and all the time. If you, you know, are talking about um, stories from the black community, then you're going to be doing it. But do you have any advice for, like, um, people that are creating movies, films, TV shows, like, how can they help, like, with that fight or any advice on what not to do, you know what I mean? Like, that's, that's all I'm asking. Do you want to answer that while Ma Mark is running to the back? Who was the question in the back? Oh. Right there. Okay, so let's, do you want to respond? Um, yeah, and I'm sure Devin has some, uh, um, so A, I, I think continuing to, to basically create content that, I don't know, is simple, tells the truth. Um, there's so much pressure, and one of the things I'm really worried about is that if people see this as just being about K through 12, um, they're not seeing the handwriting on the wall. So this is having an impact and will have an impact in DEI, um, in, in the corporate sector. Many of, of, of our, you know, um, brothers and sisters have jobs in that sector. If this gets attacked, then the resources that are made available for advertising, for content creation that's specific to our communities, that will also evaporate. So being clear that this will have impact on creatives eventually, I think is enough to begin the organizing against it before it actually happens. Um, the last thing I wanna recommend, um, uh, we did a, a panel at the at the Sundance Institute called the uh, the story of us with Brian Stevenson and David Blight and Viet Thanh Nguyen, which dealt with the fact that what we saw in January 6 is not simply a product of politics; it's a product of storytelling. It's a product of a long history of Hollywood telling a story about the exclusive rights of white people to this republic and us as basically being an afterthought. Birth of a Nation is still seen as one of the best movies ever made. And that is the story of the lost cause. That's the story of um, our degradation as a people. It's a story that re Reconstruction was a mistake. Mo more people saw that movie than see the truth about Reconstruction. So when you know that this is the bread and butter that creatives have actually participated in creating, then what we saw on January 6th is as much about what goes on in Hollywood as what goes on in the White House. That has to be a commitment that we make to tell the story of us through these initiatives that we're trying to, that we all are expecting to see um, in Hollywood. So I highly recommend it. It's called The, the Story of Us and you can, you can find it on our website. Question back there to you, Devin, I think. Um, yes, one of the, this, this was a very um, enlightening discussion, so thank you very much. One of the things that I kind of struggle with is that it seems to me that even our most liberal white allies who believe very fundamentally in um, a multicultural democracy um, also benefit from white privilege white power, um, and it's, people tend to not give up benefit and advantage voluntarily, easily, and I think um, people also struggle um, to really recognize in a real authentic way the reality of their privilege, um, and I'd, I'd be interested in just kind of hearing your thoughts on um, that intersection and how it impacts um, being able to work through all of this. Sorry for the long-winded question. Yeah, I mean, I think um, part of um, uh, the point of departure for much of the work we do is, in fact, um, getting people to understand how they exist in relationship to structures. Uh, so uh, uh, to the extent that uh, one doesn't have an understanding of the dynamics that we just described, the extent to which 
everything that's on the table now vis-a-vis -vis CRT and its attack and what that means with respect to social policy shifts has been on the table before, they're not gonna be in a good position to think about what their advocacy vis-a-vis -vis some of these broader structural problems might be. So I do think that part of the issue is you know, to use a slightly academic term, a kind of epistemological one, an understanding that people don't necessarily see um, the way structures might be working across uh, disparate domains. And true, there's always an issue about thinking through what your own individual relationship to the thing is. I get that. But to be perfectly honest, um, I would be happy if uh, tomorrow uh, people went out there and started making arguments for particular kinds of social policy, uh, for uh, particular kinds of laws, for particular kinds of interventions that are outside of the dominant frames of doing work. What that will do to them on the individual tip, I don't presume to know. And, and that's a second order of uh, business that, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't feel like I can speak competent to the, competently to that. But, but, but I do think that um, People are making the wrong arguments, are traveling with the wrong understandings, and all of that then is intersecting with the wrong projects in ways that people are not always even mindful of. So I would start with thinking big, thinking structurally, have the right understanding to make the right kind of arguments that pushes back against the various kinds of distortions that we see, and hope that that will do constitutive work with respect to how people self-interrogate. Mm. And, and I have to, I mean, I want to, to come in too as a white person with white privilege. I mean, if we haven't learned something in this period of COVID about how our individualism kills us collectively, I think we haven't been paying attention. Mm. And at a very basic level, as a creator, I think we have been sold a reality or story, a narrative of scarcity that we have got to let go of. If we don't stand with our, the, the typical has been for the white person to say, well, I got mine, maybe I won't touch that because that looks scary and the people are gonna get hurt who attend to that over there. Um, we, as white people, have got to do the opposite. I mean, these two beautiful people are not going to say what, this, what waging this fight has cost each of them individually, what it's like to fight that fight your whole frigging life. Um, I have a very long way to go before I get uncomfortable in this work or am made uncomfortable. So at the very base, the very first, I would say, especially to white creators, bring on people that teach critical race theory, talk about critical race theory, do not abandon people, do not distance yourself from people, um, do the work and maybe give up a little space. Um, Kim was kind of keen on us calling it quits, but I absolutely should not have the last word here. So um, maybe one last question. I'm here. Hi, I, I feel fortunate that I'm from Virginia, which just passed legislation adding um, African American history and social um, studies to the uh, state's curriculum and standards of learning. <laughs> <laughs> which for Virginia is, is, is incredible. Um, I am the education committee chair for the, uh, our local Arlington NAACP um, chapter, and we do a lot of work with K through 12. So my question is, and you touched on it briefly, Professor Crenshaw, how much time do we, from a strategic standpoint, how much do we spend fact checking what CRT is and isn't, and whether it's being taught in schools versus defending CRT as, as, as great and not harmful, and why it will, uh, understanding it will, will generate better citizens. Um, I, I kind of feel like mm -hmm. we're back in that place where mm -hmm. when uh, President Obama um, was, was running for office, we spent too much time defending that he's not a Muslim, he's a Christian, rather than, so what if he's Muslim? Right, right. So, so thank you. So I uh, thank you. <laughs> and I, I will take that and, 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 and use it um, 
you know, as an opportunity to, to talk about what I hope we are prepared to do. So, so I think that when we're caught in a, is it CRT or not CRT, they win. That, that's the whole point of throwing this in. And I have to say, it, it took a lot of folks a while to figure that out. Um, when this first started, I talked to a lot of people, um, diversity and inclusion, people who um, uh, were in K through 12, people who were teaching 16, 19, and um, to, to almost a person, they all thought, well, it really doesn't implicate me because I don't really teach that. And it's only at this moment where I think it's clear that it doesn't matter what it is you call what you do. If you're trying to center anti-racism in whatever you do, they're coming for you. They've, they've built this cage and they've put us all in it, right? I'm trying to figure out how to turn those lemons into lemonade. And the way I think we do it is to say, what is it that we all have in common? And what we all have in common is we understand history lives among us. We understand that not to be able to say what it is um, is a further injury. We understand that our children, if they're not given the true story about our history, then the only thing left for them to infer looking around the social terrain is there's something wrong with us, right? So my hope is that victories like yours are enough to sustain the fact that what also is happening in Virginia is they're trying to figure out if this is gonna be the wedge issue that allows them to regain the House and regain the White House. So if that gubernatorial race comes down to, oh, well, he lost on critical race theory, we can best bet that we're gonna see them roll this out more and more and more. So what does it require? I think it requires to imagine what an affirmative education looks like what it is to educate our students to participate in democracy, what it means when Brown said that education is the key to democratic participation. We've got to go back to just square one and remember public education is a public good to create citizens who can participate in this society. It's not about trying to create an official narrative, an official story about who we are and why we all have to salute to you know, um, moments and people of our past. So I think that if we can turn around the corner and talk about what it is that all our children need to know, what it is that empowers them, what it is that tells the truth, what, it, what are the truths that have to be celebrated along with the things that everybody wants wants to celebrate, like July the 4th, right? You, you can't have the one without the other. So I think affirmative is, is what we need. And I think tactically, we need to mobilize our parents as much as the other side is mobilizing their parents. We can't have these school boards in which these parents come in and intimidate the school board members and they don't hear anything from us. We've got stories to tell about what's happening to our kids in the classroom. We've got stories to tell about what happened when we learned something about our history that we had not known before. We have moments of epiphany when teachers took us under their wings and told us the truth about our situation in the society. So we need to tell those stories about the negative things that are happening. We need to tell the stories about the positive things that are happening. So I, I want to encourage us to do that. I want to say, um, AAPF has, truth be told, is the frame of the work that we're doing. And we're asking people, give us these stories. Give us the stories of your transformative moments as a teacher or as a student. Give us a story about what happens when certain things aren't talked about in the classroom. Let us arm ourselves with both the positives that can happen with a dedicated educational process and what happens when we don't do that. And the, the last thing I'll say is just this, and, and I, I feel it deeply. I, I often wonder what it was like to be African American in, in like 1870, when we were on an upward trajectory. We had a senator, we had members of the House of Representatives, we were building schools, we had jobs in, in, in federal government, we were gaining property. 
we had political power. And then all of a sudden, it, di it disappeared. And over the course of the next two decades, we lost pretty much all of that. We didn't, we didn't get to a point where we came close to what we had until the late 20th century. If we had known then what we know now, what would we have done? Would we have fought harder? Would we have made more connections? Would we insist that our elected officials represented us better? Would we have come together in every way possible to fight that retrenchment? I want to think that with the benefit of history that we do not want to repeat, that we'll learn from this past moment and come together in a way that we've never come together before. And so with that, I want to thank you all for spending this evening.